Okay, hi everyone. So I hope everyone can hear me and see my slides. Um, Perfect. Wonderful. So I'm going to talk about um, belief fusion, more precisely about probabilistic belief fusion at uh, maximum entropy by first order embedding, and which is joint work with Gabriele Kernis Berner from the Technical University in Dortmund. The main goal of our work is to aggregate beliefs of several experts in order to gain a consolidated view on a situation. For instance, imagine that you consult two doctors to figure out which disease you are suffering from. Um, while Dr. One believes that you probably suffer from disease D1 because you are showing the symptoms S1 and S2, Dr. Two is more likely convinced that you suffer from D2. Um, since the symptoms S1 and S2 are also indicators of disease D2. So both doctors justify their estimations on further knowledge and beliefs, but do not come to an agreement. Maybe because there is no direct communication between the doctors or because they just disagree. In the end, you are left with a collection of beliefs of several experts and have to make your own decision what to believe. Um, since you principally trust in both doctors in our example, uh, you want to combine their beliefs, but how? Um, from a more formal point of view, this task is known as drawing social inferences. Uh, in principle, there are two ways of drawing social inferences. The first one is called obturate merging and is illustrated in this diagram. The starting situation is described in the upper left, namely that one receives beliefs or belief bases of several, say, n reasoners. Now one inductively infers for each reasoner independently their whole belief state from the belief base. Uh, since we investigate belief fusion in a probabilistic setting, belief states are probability distributions named P here. In a second step called opinion pooling, these belief states are consolidated somehow into a single belief state, which can then be used for drawing inferences. Um, this way of drawing social inferences is understood quite well. We will have a closer look on it um, in the light of the principle of maximum entropy uh, in a minute. The second way is as follows. First, the single belief bases are merged into one aggregated belief base, uh, which happens in the upper right in the diagram. And afterwards, only this one belief base is extended to a belief state. So here to a probability distribution again. While a lot of research is done on merging and inductive reasoning taken by itself, this process of drawing social inferences as a whole is investigated relatively little. And our approach on belief fusion, which I want to present to you today, is uh, following this second way. Um, important questions which we want to answer are, is it possible to generate the same belief fusion operators as with obturate merging? And um, how are the both views on social influences interrelated? And um, is it possible to define novel operators? Before we discuss our approach, we have a closer look on obturate merging at maximum entropy uh, for the purpose of comparison, for better understanding of probabilistic belief fusion. So the first step of obturate merging is, as I said, getting from belief bases to belief states. And here, um, belief bases are finite sets of probabilistic conditionals of probabilistic conditional statements of the form, if A holds, then B follows with probability P, where A and B are, are propositional formulas in general, 
and um, P is a probability. And then belief states are probability distributions over possible words and here simply over propositional interpretations. So possible words are prop propositional interpretations for us. Um, the higher the probability of a possible world is, the more likely it represents the real world in the view of the reasoner with uh, the respective belief state. Um, the belief state is a model of a belief base if it satisfies all the conditional statements in the belief base. So if the probability of B given A is P, basically. Hence, the belief base constrains the belief state, but typically, typically does not fully determine um, a single belief state. And in our setting, we know the belief basis of the single reasoners, but um, neither know their belief state nor anything about their inference behavior. So we have to find a strategy to um, get to these belief states. And one well justified way of completing the missing information is applying the principle of maximum entropy. Um, the maximum entropy distribution is the belief base, uh, is the belief state which models the belief base and adds as less information as possible. As a consequence, it satisfies a number of essential common sense principles. Um, okay, and we want to follow this uh, direction. And uh, once the belief states are inferred, they have to be pooled in order to gain a consolidated view, a single belief state. And um, here the two major approaches for this are linear and logarithmic pooling. Um, these operations are mathematically inspired and simply calculate the arithmetic mean of probabilities or um, the geometric mean of probabilities. We don't have to go into details. Um, if the input belief states are maximum entropy distributions, these operations are called obturate linear or obturate social entropy process. Um, these two operators constitute um, the most important representatives of, of obturate merging um, as each of them satisfies some fundamental opinion pooling postulates. However, uh, there is no single operator which satisfies all, at least all widely accepted opinion pooling postulates and uh, the actual choice of an opinion pooling operator is rather goal oriented or you know, situation dependent. Hence, one could ask, uh, is it possible to justify social inference operators on another way? Uh, for example, following the second way of processing social inferences? And uh, is it possible to generate other meaningful operators than these tools? Okay, let us use these questions as an opportunity to switch to our novel approach um, which follows the idea of merging the reasoner's belief basis first before applying the principle of maximum entropy to infer uh, the consolidated belief state afterwards. Um, okay, merging first. So in contrast to most of the common approaches to merging, our approach is based on embedding propositional beliefs into a first order setting before merging. So for this, we translate propositions to unary predicates and propositional formulas to first order formulas with uh, one variable. And the, the logical connectives remain the same. So in addition, if the propositional expression 
in the propositional formula occurs in the belief base of uh, reasoner I, uh, we instantiate the translated first order formula with a constant I so that we obtain a closed formula which is interpretable, um, which is a, a, a sentence basically. So in this way, we translate a conditional B given A with probability P to a conditional if the first order translation of A instantiated with I holds, then the first order translation of B instantiated with I holds with probability P. Um, provided that the original conditional was part of the belief base of reason I. The resulting um, no closed first order conditional is to be understood as if A holds, then B follows with probability P, but in the view of reason or I. Um, a consequence of this is that uh, conditionals from different reasoners are syntactically separated in the sense that their first order translations do not share any ground atoms, basically because they use um, different constants. Okay, and as a further consequence, the first order translations of all conditional beliefs can simply be merged to a large belief base by simply set union um, because you do not risk any conflicts that could cause inconsistencies um, because of the syntactical separation. And the resulting belief base R is um, somehow of collection of all the beliefs brought to the decision maker's attention. After merging, the beliefs can still be matched to the contributing reasoners through the constant that is used. One important consequence of the first order embedding is that beliefs of several reasoners that originally dealt with the same issue lose their connection because of this syntactical separation. Um, let me give an example. Um, if two reasoners I and J express their beliefs about a disease D, they um, used both the proposition D, but now the translated beliefs mention D of I and D of J as ground atoms. And um, yes, you need a semantical connection between these different ground atoms. More generally, a semantical connection between different instantiations or groundings of the same conditional has to be established. We do this by introducing so-called open conditionals that um, can be read as if A holds, then B follows with probability P in the view of the group of reasoners. Um, in this talk, open conditionals are probabilistic conditionals, um, the antecedent and the consequent of which are first order formulas that mention one free variable, x in this case. The variable that can be instantiated with the ID of the reasoner, of course. That is, a of x, is the first order translation of the propositional formula A with free variable x and um, B of x is the first order translation of the propositional formula B also with uh, free variable x. Or in other words, the open conditionals are the first order translations of the reasoner's conditionals but that are not instantiated with the reasoner's ID. Um, open, no, open conditionals need a more sophisticated evaluation than conditional probabilities can provide because it is unclear how to interpret formulas with uh, free variables at the moment. But once such a semantics of open conditionals is fixed, 
we are able to define a fused belief state at maximum entropy. Um, a conditional B given A with probability P, here the propositional conditional, um, holds in our fused belief state if and only if the maximum entropy model of our merged belief base R um, um, entails the open conditional B of X given A of X with probability P. Just a little side remark, the maximum entropy distribution um, itself does not depend on the um, semantics of the open conditionals, but um, the essential message is the belief fusion operation defined this way does. Um, and so the semantics of open conditionals plays the same role as the opinion pooling strategy in optimate merging. And what we have done in the paper is uh, we compared different semantics of open conditionals in the light of belief fusion and uh, found out that two of them correspond to linear and logarithmic pooling and three others uh, lead to other belief fusion methods uh, and in one case uh, even to a novel belief fusion method that is not mentioned in literature before. Um, yes, in detail the semantics are the grounding semantics um, and the grounding semantics an open conditional with probability p holds if the conditional probability of each grounding of the conditional equals p. This means that all reasoners from 1 to n have to agree in their evaluation of this conditional um, so that the decision maker would accept the conditional. The second uh, semantics is the averaging semantics and the averaging semantics is the arithmetic mean of conditional probabilities and um, in this sense it is it corresponds to linear pooling but linear pooling of conditional probabilities. And we had a look on the aggregating semantics. Um, the aggregating semantics is the sum of of the probabilities of the antecedent and the consequent of the groundings of the conditional divided through the sum of the probabilities of the antecedent of the groundings. Um, and one can prove that the aggregating semantics corresponds to linear pooling of probabilities um, to OLAP. Um, Two minutes. Yes, thanks. Um, if it is applied to maximum entropy. And um, four and five, the uniformity semantics and the approving semantics, um, but which I do not want to discuss here. Um, the uniformity semantics we could show corresponds to logarithmic pooling. Let us have a look at a very simple example to see that these semantics do different things. Um, again, consider two doctors. The first doctor believes if symptom S holds, then disease D uh, follows with probability 0 0.9. And the second doctor believes in the same, but with probability 0 0.8. So um, what would you believe? With which probability does disease D follow from symptom S. Um, certainly this depends on which type of reasoner you are and uh, basically which semantics of open conditionals you accept. And um, for example, the grounding semantics would infer nothing because the doctors disagree. The averaging semantics would be the arithmetic mean of both probabilities, 0 0.85 and the others two are the known semantics, linear pooling and uh, logarithmic pooling. Um, the one probability is a bit lower, the other probability is a bit higher than the arithmetic mean of the conditional probabilities. And the uh, approving semantics is not uh, mean at all. In fact, the approving semantics, um, yes, um, 
strengthen positive beliefs, um, the more experts give voice to them. And finally, before I want to conclude, um, I want to try to answer the obvious question, why are you doing this overhead with first order embedding and so on? Um, and here are some motivating thoughts. Just merging the belief basis of the single reasoners is too simple as it usually leads to inconsistencies. Uh, for instance, this would already have happened in the very simple example on the slide before. And to overcome this problem, one could think about translating the conditionals but remain propositional. Um, the beliefs, if A holds, then B follows with probability, probability P, could be translated to if A i holds, then b i follows with probability p where a i and b i are still propositions but however also here a connection between these uh, novel um, propositions is needed um, and something similar is done in the um, approach of kenny sperner and Röder. the fresh propositions are introduced representing the viewpoint um, of the reasoners, but um, one can show that this way kind of affects the maximum entropy optimizing, optimization strategy. Um, and at least it does not give an explanation for the linear, linear and logarithmic pooling of maximum entropy um, distributions. So um, the, the way translating conditionals to first order conditionals uh, was able to, to um, explain OLAP and OSEP. So let us conclude. Uh, we draw social inferences following the second way of first merging and then doing inductive inference. And merging was um, based on the first order embedding and inductive inference on the principle of maximum entropy. And uh, we were able to um, generate different belief fusion operators by varying the semantics of open conditionals. And um, in future work, we want mainly to do the way the other way around. So um, there are many postulates for belief fusion and we want um, to know if one can um, benefit from these postulates when um, justifying semantics of open conditionals um, or um, find novel semantics of open conditionals. Okay, thank you for your attention. I'm Amar. I will be presenting my joint work with Dr. Haytham Smail on information revision, the joint revision of belief and trust. We're from the German University in Cairo. I hope you enjoy our presentation and you find it interesting, and I promise to keep it short and to the point. So, our main conviction, as the title suggests, is that we believe that belief revision and trust revision are inseparable processes that should be carried together. So, the presentation is structured as follows. I will motivate why do we think this approach is indeed beneficial, I will show formal representation and formal tools that we need in order to carry on the revision process. And then I will finalize with AGM style postulate for the joint revision of belief and trust. Now, as you all know, belief revision and trust have been extensively studied in logic, KR, philosophy and psychology and many other fields. However, trust revision in particular did not get its fair share of attention because trust is handled differently in different fields throughout this presentation and in our paper, we're mainly concerned in trust in sources of information or information sources. And by that, we mean trust in the reliability of an information source. Research on belief revision with the most renowned approach AGM, as you all of course know, has not considered trust or trust revision to the degree that seems required. And as I previously stated, it is our conviction that trust and revision, belief revision are intertwined processes. To strengthen this point, consider the following example. Now this example is based on Game of Thrones. I hope some of you have watched the show and I promise you, unlike the last two seasons, this example does not suck. So the army of the 
Dead is marching towards Winterfell, the largest castle in their way to total domination. We have John, who is the Lord of Winterfell and is very trusted by his people, preparing for battle. Before the battle, John sends the children and the elderly to a secret location for safety. John has two advisors, Peter, his oldest advisor, and Sam, a new advisor. After some time, Peter hurries to the safe place and tells the people that we won. People believe him, people cheered, and rushed out of the safe place to celebrate. However, to their surprise, they found John coming back from the battle saying in dismay, we in fact lost. Now we have two conflicting pieces of information, that we won and that we lost. And the question should be, which proposition should the survivors or the living be believing? And I think that most people would say that we should believe we lost because it's coming from John himself. And I think that when it comes to the topic of John winning or losing a war, John is more trusted than Peter. After some time of the battle, the survivors escaped Winterfell. And one of the survivors, named Tyrion, found a strange looking plant called Freya. The survivors are hungry and Tyrion wants to help them feast. He believes that this Freya plant is edible and on his way to get some of this Freya plant to his colleagues, he remembers that the person who told him that Freya is edible was Peter. And now the question is, should Tyrion keep believing that Freya is edible? One might say that, yes, he should, because Freya is edible as a proposition is completely logically irrelevant from John winning or losing the battle. Another one would say, Freya is edible comes from the same source that just misled us and that we trust this source now less and hence beliefs that were conveyed or acquired through this source could suffer. What this example shows us are the following points. First of all, trust acts as an information filter. So in example one, we believe the piece of information that was conveyed by John over the piece of information that was conveyed by Peter. Also, we trust some information source less if what they told us turns out to be false or if that they were misleading us. And that's what happened to our trust in Peter after example one. Also, logically unrelated beliefs may be retracted or weakened in the course of belief revision, not due to belief revision or logic relevance, but due to changes in trust. And this is the case of disbelieving or at least doubting that Freya is edible in example two. I hope by now it's obvious that believing a piece of information depends on trusting whoever or whatever was the conveyor and that trusting someone or something depends on how much we believe the information they conveyed to us. Having motivated why we believe belief trust and belief revision and trust revision are intertwined, I now follow along with the representation. So, we refer to the joint revision of trust and belief as information revision. In order for an agent to carry out the process of information revision, it needs to be able to represent not only its beliefs as traditional belief revision, but also its trust attribution in sources, as well as a record of which information source conveyed which piece of information. This form of structure we refer to as an information state. Now to a piece of notation. Information revision is the process of revising a particular information state, let's call it K, with the conveyance of an arbitrary formula phi conveyed by a source sigma denoted this way. Now, something that is really important to notice is that unlike traditional belief revision approaches, we are not revising the belief base or the information state with only the formula, but also, most importantly, the source of that formula is taken into account. So, without getting into complex formalizations, I just want to show you how would a belief or an information state look like. So, assume a propositional language LV with a set of propositional variables John 1 and Freya is at. An information state is formally a triple what we call a belief base, a trust base, and the history. The belief base contains the beliefs that are believed by the agent. And in this case, Tyrion, the last agent that we took a look at in example two, might believe that John did not win with a degree of 10. Do not worry, I will mention what the degrees are shortly. 
The trust base might look something like this. Information source Peter is attributed a degree of one, and information source John is attributed a degree of 10. And finally, the history contains a tuple for every source formula pair that were conveyed to us. So Peter conveyed that Freya is edible. Peter also conveyed that John won, and John himself conveyed that John did not win. Now, the degrees of belief or the degrees of trust are any arbitrary values that are just preference measures. We do not require them to be numeric. We do not require them to be anything in particular, and they need not be the same thing. Just preference measures in order to facilitate the revision of both beliefs and trust. Okay, now, another piece of notation that will deem helpful in it shortly. If we have a formula phi and an information source sigma, we say that formula phi is more entrenched in an information state K2 over another information state K1, they wrote it this way, if phi is not believed in K1, but believed in K2, or if phi's degree of belief increased in K2 over K1. Similarly, we say that sigma is more trusted in state K2 over state K1, they wrote it this way, if sigma's degree of trust increased in K2 over K1. Now, having introduced information states, I now introduce what we call support graphs. Traditionally, belief revision is concerned with minimal change. That is, the revision process should make as, as, as few changes as possible to the belief base. However, for information revision, we model this minimality principle using relevance. And I, I hope by now you can all see that the degrees of trust in sources affect the degrees of belief in formulas conveyed by these sources and vice versa. And hence, our notion of relevance is not only restricted to logical relevance, but also accounts for what we call source relevance. And the intuition is this. When an information state K is revised with a formula phi conveyed by a source sigma, we want to confine changes in belief and trust only in formulas and sources relevant to phi, sigma, and not phi. All right? So, before I provide the formal definition, consider the set of preliminaries, starting with a piece of notation due to Hansen, which says that a set of formulas is called phi kernel if it derives phi and no proper subset of this set derives phi. We also use this notation sigma of h to denote the formulas conveyed by source sigma. S sub k is the set containing all the information sources that conveyed anything to us in the history formulas of the beliefs are just the be all the belief formulas and phi sub k is just the set containing the belief formulas and the formulas in the history even if they were not believed. With that, assume that we have an information state k. The support graph g of k is such that you could have sources or formulas as nodes and this is a novel contribution having sources and formulas not just formulas as nodes and the edges are such that a source U, there is an edge between a source U and the formula V. If source U previously conveyed formula V, formula U has an edge to formula V if formula U belongs to some V kernel. And finally, formula U has an edge to source V if source V himself or itself conveyed U previously. Now, with the basic definition of edges, a general definition of support is as follows. A node U supports a node V if there is a simple path from U to V. Further, as we said that we want to model minimality using relevance, we define relevance this way. A node U is relevant to a node V if U supports V or if V supports U. With that, this is an example of the support graph of Therian's information state after example two. So we have that information source Peter conveyed that John won and that Freya is edible, and we had that information source John conveyed that John did not win. Here's the thing to be noticed, and that's interesting. The proposition John won is completely logically irrelevant from the proposition Freya is edible. However, as we can see, there is a path, a simple path from both to each other, which means they are both relevant to each other. So intuitively, changes in beliefs for this proposition or this belief could even affect changes in belief in this proposition, which is not allowed due to the principle of minimality in the traditional belief revision approaches. However, with our 
no notion of general support that includes sources as well, it is possible. Having defined our formal structures, we're now ready to present the postulates of information revision that we believe any rational operator should observe. Starting with consistency. This piece of notation just says that the consequence of the belief formulas after revision is consistent. And because of the core of belief revision, achieving consistency is paramount. We believe that any rational operation of information revision should retain the consistency of the belief base, even if the formula of revision is itself a contradiction. Moving on, we have resilience which said that trust should not increase in any source that conveys a contradiction. And we have one of the most important postulates, which says that if we're revising with phi and we're starting from a consistent belief base, then phi should never become less entrenched. Similarly, if we're revising with phi, we're providing absolutely no evidence for not phi and hence not phi should not become more entrenched. Moreover, if a formula, an arbitrary formula psi, becomes more entrenched after revision, then it is supported by the formula of revision. But on the other hand, if some formula after revision became less entrenched, then there is one of two cases. The first one is that this formula psi is relevant to not phi, and what happened is that phi succeeded, or not phi became less entrenched. The other possibility is that psi is relevant to phi. However, the revision did not favor phi, so phi was rejected, or phi became less entrenched. Now, we consider postulates regarding beliefs. Now, we will consider postulates regarding trust change. And the first one is called positive relevance. And it says, if for some arbitrary information source sigma prime became more trusted, then phi succeeded because there must be new support added for trust in any source to increase. And then there are two possibilities. Any source sigma prime other than the conveyor itself must be supported by the newly added formula phi. Or if trust increased in the source of the formula itself, then there must be already existing independent believed evidence for phi. Okay, to eliminate self-support and to eliminate trust increase by virtue of just confirming what you already said. Finally, if trust in some source sigma prime decreased, then there are two possibilities as well. The first one is that phi succeeded and you're relevant to not phi, sigma prime is relevant to not phi, or if trust in the source of the piece of information that we're revising with itself decreased or the source became less trusted, then it must be that there is independent evidence for the negation of phi that is believed and led to the rejection of phi. To wrap up, as I have said 100 times throughout this presentation, we do believe that belief and trust revision are intertwined and should not be separated. We introduced the notion of information states that allows for the representation of information in a way that facilitates the revision process and is powerful enough to capture most of the modalities and approaches in the literature that are concerned with either belief or trust revision. We introduced support graphs. That is a formal structure which allows us to identify relevance relations between not only formulas, but also information sources. And finally, we proposed the postures that we believe any rational information revision operator should observe. So what are the next steps? We intend to define a representation theorem for the postulates we provided, and we also intend to further investigate conveyance and information acquisition to further allow agents to even trust and mistrust their own perceptions. With that said, I hope you enjoyed this presentation, and I'm ready for any of your questions. Um, so, hi, my name is Felipe Hezina, and the title of our paper is a survey on multiple revision. And, well, here is a brief outline of the presentation. We will start with the motivation. So, after that, I will talk about the classical revision. 
And then I will show some of the early steps on multiple revision, like the first approach developed to, to do with multiple revision. And then I will show further approaches that were developed after that. And then finally, a conclusion and some open problems of the area. Okay, so I'll start with the motivation example for belief revision. It's a very well-known example in the literature. And I have a bird in the trap. So I have some beliefs about this situation. I know that the bird caught in the trap is a swan. I know that the bird caught in the, caught in the trap comes from Sweden. I know that Sweden is part of Europe and all European swans are right. So as a consequence of my beliefs, I know that the bird caught in the trap is white. However, I open the trap and then I realize, I receive as a new information that the bird caught in the trap is black. So what to do with the information I have? Uh, which beliefs should I give up in order to avoid inconsistency because something is wrong? Or what if the new information comes in block? For example, uh, I know that the bird caught the trap is black and in addition, uh, I get the information that it comes from France. And so how should I treat the, uh, more than one new sentence at the same time? So we reach the central topic of this work that is multiple revision. And why a survey? Well, because of the importance of the topic, as we will see here through the presentation. Uh, there is no survey about this, uh, about this topic until now, so far. And so our purpose is to bring or and organize the state of the art in the area, uh, showing approach since 1988 and show as well some open problems that still could be of our attention. Uh, so about classical revision, well, belief revision. So what's belief revision? We have, when we, uh, in epistemological theory, we have the epistemic states. Epistemic states are representations of the cognitive states of some agent, a rational agent. So a belief revision is a study of the epistemic states and its dynamics. Uh, uh, it shows is the study how a rational agent should proceed in face of new information. And there are some models to represent these epistemic states. And one of the most common models are belief sets or theories that are sets of sentences closed under logical consequence. And in the belief change area, whose main framework is the AGN theory, uh, we have three possible epistemic changes in relation to a sentence alpha. I have a belief set with my beliefs, and then I receive a new sentence. And uh, in relation to a sentence alpha, I can have three possible epistemic chains. I can have an expansion when alpha was undetermined and now alpha is implied. I can have a contraction when alpha was implied and now alpha is undetermined. Or I can have a revision when alpha was not implied and now it is implied. So we are interested in particularly in this last operation. And in the AGM revision framework, so I start with a belief set K, I receive a new sentence alpha, and so I want to calculate a new set in which alpha is implied and a constant set. So starting to talk about multiple revision. Well, multiple revision, so is the generalization of the operation mentioned before when you don't receive just a single sentence as input, but a set of sentences. And uh, let's suppose you receive a new set formed by alpha and beta. So re a revision by this set is different from uh, the revision by the disjunction of the sentence, because ac accepting the disjunction of the input sentences, uh, it, it's not the same as revising by the whole set 
because you may admit their disjunction without admitting any of them, for example. Uh, it's not the same as the intersection of the results of revising by alpha and of revising by beta, because the final result will be too small to, to what we really want. Uh, you could, for example, say that we, we can first revise by alpha and then by beta or vice, ver vice versa. But it's another topic, it's iterated revision and the order in which you perform revision makes difference in the, in the final result. So that's not our goal here. Or you can say, okay, we could revise by the conjunction of the sentences. In some cases, you, it's possible to, to make this reduction, but not always. So, so it's important to study multiple revision in which you treat all the new sentences with the same priority and at the same time. The first approach for multiple revision, it was done by Furman. He, he proposed like two kinds of multiple revision. You can have package revision in which you would like to, to absorb the whole new set of information or you, can have, or you can have choice revision in which you are happy with just a subset of the input set. Uh, in classical revision, the uh, revision was defined through the Levi identity. It's defined as a compound operation formed by a contraction followed by an expansion. Uh, so he proposed a general, generalized version of the Levi identity in which you don't receive just a sentence, but a set of sentences. In which you contract by the negation of the input and then you expand by the input. And he, uh, he showed that in some situations, if the input is finite and if the underlying logic is closed under negation, uh, conjunction, disjunction of sentences, you could have this reduction of to us to a singleton revision. Okay, and we have other initial results. Uh, first, we have the generalization of Grove's result. Grove proposed a construction for belief revision called system of spheres. That is a construction based on the model of possible worlds. And Lindstrom was the first to state that Grove's model can be generalized to multiple revision. And he took the first steps towards that. We also have the extension for basis. Be belief basis is another, uh, are another kind of sentential model. Differently from belief sets, belief bases are sets of sentences not necessarily closed under logical consequence. So Hanson proposed some adaptations of the postulates and he defined uh, the the, the operation through the Levi identity and gave some representation results. And we also have, again from Furman, the definition of package revision with the construction partial meet. Partial meet is a construction based on remainder sets that are maximal, no implying subsets of the belief set in relation to the input. Okay, so after the, this first approach developed, we have some other here that we want to mention. Uh, the first is the, the account of infinitary belief revision. So the authors realized that the generalization of belief revision to the multiple case still needed to define how to deal with infinite inputs. So they proposed two new operations. The operation of general contraction that differently from classical AGM contraction, if you have a belief set K and an input set A, the purpose of a general contraction of K by A is to delete sentences from K so that the remaining set is constant with, is consistent with A and logically closed. And from general contraction, they define a general revision or set revision through the Levi identity. And they also proposed a new property called the limit postulate uh, that was necessary to define, to specify infinite belief changes. 
the idea here is to assume that the contraction by, uh, the in, by an infinite set has a limit of the contractions by its finite subsets or the revisions, sorry. Um, okay, so we have some approaches uh, also developed about uh, using system of spheres. Uh, the pro system of spheres uh, after the initial work developed by Lindstrom. So we have these works here uh, developed by these other authors. And the problems explored are smoothness conditions and their relation with multiple revision and additional constraints demanded by the limit postulate. Uh, the lim they proposed uh, new properties that are variations of the limit assumption. The limit assumption is one of the conditions of system of spheres. And so they propose some variations, uh, some stronger versions and so to, in order to be able to define a constructive model for multiple revision based on system of spheres. We also have the definition of direct constructions. Why direct? Because in classical AGM revision, uh, revision was defined through the Levi identity and also by uh, in multiple revision by the general, generalized version of Levi identity. But these authors try to define belief revision without using contraction as an intermediate step. So the, problem ex the problems explored are the multiple package revision on belief basis without using contraction and also for hard logic. They propose a new properties and new constructions as well, partial meet and kernel constructions. Uh, partial meet we mentioned before, kernel, a kernel construction is, is based on the concept of kernel sets that are minimal implying subsets. And, and they also gave representation results. We, we have some approaches uh, in the, the field of non-prioritized multiple revision. Non-prioritized revision is when the input doesn't have like total supremacy over the previous beliefs. And we have some approaches. We have the, the one for, we have three for choice revision. We have one based on the Levi identity. We have one based on the scriptor revision. The scriptor revision is an approach that applies a select direct pr procedure by considering that there is a set of belief sets that uh, works uh, as possible, uh, that work as possible results of belief change. And this change is implemented through a direct choice among these, uh, these possible results. And the third approach here for choice revision is based on multiple believability relations. What's a believability relation? Uh, a believability relation between two sentences is, for example, is a binary relation representing that the subject is at least as prone to believing alpha as to believing beta, for example. And it was generalized to the multiple case and use it to define choice revision. We also have uh, semi-revision explanations. Semi-revision is an operation defined by Hanson for single sentences in which the input, the input is added to the base and then the possible in inconsistencies are removed. It means that it's possible to remove the new sentence you have just added, for example. So the authors of this approach stated that a better account of explanation can be obtained with same revision so they proposed an operation that receives as input explanations, which are for a, a formula with supporting claims for that formula. And they claim it that their operation was an intermediate form between semi-revision and merge. And in all of them, we have the proposal of cons uh, constructions axiomatically characterized. And we have also uh, some approaches based on core beliefs. What is core belief? Uh, the belief set to be revised when we have the, a core belief 
The belief set to be revised, it has a subset taken, considered as core, which is entirely preserved independently of the new information. So the problem explorer was no prioritized multiple revision based on the concept of core beliefs. They proposed two new operations. It's evaluative multiple revision in which the treat uh, before performing revision, you take the input and uh, to, a to a decision separate model and, and to divide it in the plausible information and implausible information. And rational metabolic revision you you absorb the whole new input and after that you remove some inconsistencies based on your core beliefs they proposed called the new constructions based on kernels and remainders and both were axiomatically characterized uh, as a conclusion we saw here a brief uh, a brief explanation of more than 30 years of multiple revision uh, we the the approaches the models were based on two main two main models of abstent states sentation models so it's for uh, belief sets belief bases uh, belief states and also possible worlds and two types of multiple revision that's package and choice revision and here's some open problems in the area we have the, the interrelations between package, kernel, and partial meat revision to be studied further. Have the characterization of non prioritized revision and uh, multiple revision in a unified way uh, without dividing it into two modules. Uh, we have the to, to study and establish the differences and connections between choice revision via the Levi identity and the one based on the script revision. We also have a choice revision without using contraction. That's what happens with the Levi identity and also infinite inputs. Uh, the generalization of selective revision to the multiple case and the study of the relation between no prioritized multiple revision and merge operators.